at Shopify. Uh, this is our quick story of how we survived Black Friday and Cyber Monday uh, last year and in the past few years. My name is Christian. Um, see Georgie on Twitter and GitHub. Don't follow me. There's no point. <laughs> um, I'm from Montreal. So three months a year, this is what Montreal looks like. Cars are just buried in snow. Um, people push buses, and there is maple syrup heists. <laughs> And there's Putin, which is probably the best reason to come to Montreal. Uh, so I work at Shopify. Uh, Shopify is uh, a company that is trying to make commerce better for everyone. Uh, our platform allows merchants to sell stuff on any channel, well, on multiple channels. Primarily on what we call the web channel, which is uh, websites. So we give our, our merchants the ability to customize the HTML, CSS of their websites. They also have access to Liquid so that they can really fully customize their um, the look and feel of their site. We also have a point of sale for brick and mortar <coughs> stores. And we have a mobile app for people on the go that want to accept payments. Our stack is a pretty traditional Rails app. If you've seen uh, John Duff's talk earlier, um, I'm probably going to repeat a lot of things, but use Nginx, Unicorn, Rails 4, and Ruby 2.1. So we're on the latest versions of everything, well, except for Ruby, I guess. Uh, use MySQL. We have uh, around 100 app servers running in production, which uh, accounts for roughly 2,000 unicorn workers. We have 20 job servers with around 1,500 uh, rescue workers. So what kind of scale are we talking about? So as I talk about scale, so I need to like throw big numbers at you, otherwise you just won't be impressed, and this whole talk will be kind of useless. So we have uh, 150,000 merchants on Shopify as of uh, last night check. And these merchants account for around 400,000 requests per minute uh, on average. Uh, but we've seen peaks up to a million requests per minute uh, during what we call flash sales. These requests amount up to, um, we basically processed up to $4 billion in GNV last year. Uh, so if you do the math, that's around seven thousand dollars per minute. So any minute we're down, we're basically burning money, and and someone somewhere is losing money. So because we're in the commerce industry, we have to deal with this uh, these really fun days that we call Black Friday and uh, Cyber Monday. Uh, we yeah, Black Friday is crazy, um, but Cyber Monday we actually call it the Cyber Fun Day. Because usually, when Black Friday goes well, um, we can just kick back and relax for Cyber Monday because it, it won't be any worse than Black Friday. <laughs> so this kind of stuff happens in malls. Like people go crazy, they, like they fight for each other to get like this TV and stuff. But it turns out um, Black Friday is pretty crazy on the internet too. Who would expect? Uh, so we see around. Um, so last year we saw 600,000 requests per minute. So that's about two times our, our average traffic on a normal day. We also processed uh, three times more um, money during those four days than on average. So it's, it's a pretty big time of the year for us, and we just we can't afford to be down. Everything has to go perfectly. So in order to understand a bit better the, the decisions we made to uh, scale Shopify, you have to understand that we use Unicorn. So each request uh, ties up a Unicorn worker. So in order to scale Shopify, we need to either reduce the response time or increase the amount of workers we have. So I'm just going to go through the various techniques that we've taken to reduce the response time. Um, and hopefully, you'll be able to uh, take some of this and apply it to your own apps. So our first line of defense is what we call page caching. So the idea here is, um, we make this observation that if, let's say, 10,000 people hit the same page at the same time, uh, chances are what we're going to respond is going to be the same thing. So it's kind of crappy that we're doing all this computation 10,000 times, right, for 10,000 requests to the same page. It would be cool if we can just uh, do the computation once and serve the, the same data to the, the rest of the people. Um, the problem here is that, as you can see, 
there's this thing called, on, on this particular page, there's the, the amount of items in your cart. Um, on some pages, people are logged in also, so the, the page won't be exactly the same. Uh, so we, we wrote this gem called Cacheable. And what it is, is a generational caching system. So what this means is that um, we don't have to manually bus cache, because bus and cache is what, the, the hardest thing to do in computer science, from what I, I read. And the other thing is what, naming things? That's, that's tough, yeah. <laughs> Off by one error, yeah. Uh, so yeah, so the idea here is that we don't have to manually bus the cache. The way this works is that the cache key, so the key in MedCache, is based on the data that you're, that you're actually caching in, in MedCache. So I'm just going to go through um, what a typical example of cacheable looks like. So in this, this is a post controller with a very simple index action. We are uh, scoping the posts per shop because we're a multi-tenant um, app. And we're also doing pagination. And you'll notice that we wrapped the, um, the action with this thing called response cache. <coughs> Response cache does all this nice magic. <coughs> and you'll notice there's also a method called cache key data. So whatever this method returns, we're going to basically do a, a two string on it, and we're going to do an MD5 hash on it, and that's going to be the key in that cache. And the value will be whatever is yielded there, so the, the response. So here's like a, an example of um, how we're generating the cache key for this request. So you notice the shop ID is 1. Let's just pretend. Uh, the path is posts, format, whatever, params, like we decided that we're going to put the page param within the cache sheet because you, you don't want the cache for page one to be the same thing as the cache for page two, right? Uh, and you notice there's this thing called shop version, and this is what makes it generational. So every time a post is updated or created or deleted, uh, we're going to increment this counter. So what, what happens is that if this shop version is in the cache key for everything that's cached, all the cache will just go away and we're going to start populating a new cache key. Does that make sense? Yeah? Okay. Um, the other thing that this, uh, this library gives us is uh, gzip support. So when we cache the HTML into Metacache, we gzip it right away. So when the request comes in, if we find a key in Metacache for that cache key, we just take whatever is in Metacache and just serve it directly to the browser. Um, so the, the nice benefit here is we're also saving on bandwidth because we're sending gzip data to the browser directly. Um, on the front of uh, saving bandwidth, we also do e-tag in 304 not modified. So if the browser decides to cache the data within the browser, we don't have to send anything <coughs> to it. We just tell it 304 not modified, and it just serves it up from, from the browser cache directly. So let me show you some numbers. Uh, this is what our graph looks like for cache hits versus misses. So the blue line is uh, cache hits, and the misses are the, the purple line. So we get about 60% hit rate on this page caching. That's huge. That's like 60% of 400,000 requests per minute, um, which is absolutely crazy. So these requests don't hit the database. They don't do any, any parsing of liquid templates, any compiling like of liquid. They really just take the, the data from that cache and serve it directly to the browser. Um, the problem with page cache is that when we have a, a sale, so let's say some shop does uh, this massive sale where lots of people are buying stuff at the same time, you'll notice on the, on the graph that the, um, the uh, cash rate goes down. And this is because we're continually updating the inventory on the products being bought, which upgrade, uh, which bumps the shop version. So basically this shop is not running any page cache during a flash sale. But we still get 40% cache hits in that case, so it's still pretty good. Our second line of defense is uh, query caching. So we do around um, 60,000 queries per second, which is absolutely crazy. Um, and so we, we want to we reduce the stress on a database. So we have this thing called identity cache, which is uh, a gem that's open source. And what it does is it, it caches it marshals down active records and it, it caches them directly into Metcache so that we don't have to hit uh, MySQL uh, when we need these records. Um, the cache is opt-in by design. So the idea is that when you want to use the cache, you have to actually, um, there's a method called fetch, and when you use fetch instead of find, you're actually loading it from identity cache. 
the idea here is that in mission critical areas like say um, a checkout process, you don't want to rely on cache because cache can be wrong. You want to really hit the, the database directly. So we decided to make this opt-in by design. The caveat to identity cache is that um, unlike generational caching, uh, we have to manually bust the cache for IBC. So we have an after commit book that whenever a, a record is modified or uh, an association of a record, we go manually delete the keys in that cache. So the problem with this is that there could be race conditions where you manage to save in the database, but you don't manage to, to clear the memcache keys. But it's something that doesn't happen very often, and we're OK with that trade-off. So what does identity cache look like? This is a very simple example. It's sort of like a product model that includes identity cache. Um, a product has many images. And you'll notice that uh, we're caching the has many relationship. And we put embed true there. I'll explain what that means. Um, so basically, uh, you see, instead of doing product.find with the ID, we're doing fetch. So this will actually uh, load the, the data from the database if it's not cached. And when it does that, it's going to save it into identity cache after the fact. You also notice that we're doing fetch images. You can kind of see like what's going on here, right? You, you replace find by fetch, and, and that's how you use identity cache. So the cool thing with embedding is that these two, um, these two calls do one memcache call because the images are embedded within the same record. Does that make sense? It's pretty cool, right? So like we're, we're saving two MySQL queries uh, over one memcache query, which is, is really good in the, in the grand scheme of things. Uh, identity cache also allows us to uh, provide secondary indexes. So you don't always want to find a product by ID, right? Like in, in our case, we use handles. So your product is like slash product slash the handle. So identity cache allows you to define secondary indexes so you can load a product, um, in our case, by shop ID and by handle. So let's look at some, uh, some graphs again. So this is uh, cache hits and misses for identity cache. You can barely see the misses. It's pretty crazy. So. Um, even, so basically like the blue line, every time there's a cache hit, we're saving a call on MySQL, which is pretty crazy. During a flash sale, uh, there's no dip. Because during a flash sale, like I mentioned, all we're really doing is we're updating inventory count. So we're doing a single update on a single product. So it, it's such a, such a small thing in the grand scheme of things that, that there's no dip at all. So these are, these are two strategies. The third one is, uh, backgrounding things. So because we're, in a, because we're doing commerce stuff, we have to deal with payment gateways. I'm not sure if you've dealt with payment gateways before, but this is a 95th percentile of uh, response time of payment gateways. Five seconds. <laughs> um, so if our unicorn workers had to wait five seconds, <coughs> during a sale, like, we'd just be down. Like, there, there wouldn't be anything we could do. So, um, we background these kind of things. So we background a lot of things. We background webhooks, uh, email sending, payment processing jobs, also like fraud analysis, basically anything that doesn't have to be done in that request, we background so that we can release the uniform workers as soon as possible and then continue processing for other requests. Nice benefit of, of doing this is that uh, depending on how you set up your, your queue, um, you can do throttling with with, uh, with background jobs. So you can say only allocate a maximum amount of workers to a specific queue, and you know that only that many uh, jobs will pop up at the same time. So now what? So we have um, everything in place to handle uh, 600,000 requests per minute, right? Thing is, um, regressions happen, right? And the best way to know if a regression happened is uh, measuring things. So we have this thing at Shopify where we just measure all the things. So we have thousands and thousands of, of, of graphs and, and um, measures. And the way we do this is with StatsD. I'm sure if you've all used StatsD before, but it's basically a server that you run that you throw numbers at it, and it aggregates these numbers, and it gives you 95th percentile, minimums, maximum, counts, um, you name it. And with this data, you can then plot, plot it on different uh, backends. So we have this gem that um, makes it a lot easier for us to instrument our code. Uh, it's called Stats the Instrument. 
And this is an example of how we use it. So we have this class called liquid template. Uh, we can extend it with uh, the module. And then we can call stats D measure on it. And what stats D measure will do is it's going to measure the amount of time it takes to call the render method. And it's going to save that metric into um, the liquid.template.render stats D key. And what this gives us in the end is we can plot these graphs of the 95th percentile of, of liquid template render method, which is pretty cool. Uh, the gem also gives us stats D count. So you can count the amount of times things are called. So in our case, we count the amount of times the perform action is called on the payment processing job, which gives us the amount of payment processing jobs that we run. So this is all fun, right? Like, what is this good for? Uh, we use this service called Datadog, which is one of the, which is a, a backend to, to StatsD. And we plot all this data on our dashboard. <coughs> and this is actually our, our health dashboard. So at a glimpse of an eye, we can see if Shopify is doing well or not, and we can identify regressions pretty quickly. <coughs> cool thing about Datadog is it does alerts. So I, I found this, I was looking for a screenshot, I found this alert. So one of our ops set up an alert on whenever the temperature of the ops room goes above 24 degrees Celsius, it fires off like these alarms, and I find it pretty funny. <laughs> um, but yeah, you can get clever and, and, and do um, really useful alerts with uh, Datadog. That's, that sounds all fun and, and, and perfect, but it's, it's not perfect. Uh, even though we have all this in place, regressions can still happen, and, and sometimes they, they, you don't find out about them until it's too late. And we don't want this to happen, so we do, um, we do load testing a lot. We have this tool called Genghis Khan. <laughs> Basically what it is, it simulates Black Friday and Cyber Monday. Sounds pretty crazy. <coughs> It's actually really simple. It's just a tool that, that simulates a person going through the checkout process and buying something. And it just does that thousands of times concurrently for, for many, many minutes. And we just see what happens. We're basically just DDoSing Shopify in production to see if it's going to work. So you might, you might as well break before Black Friday if it's going to break. Oh, and we do this several times a week. <laughs> It helps us um, plan for capacity. It, it, it ensures us that when Black Friday does happen, that we're going to be totally fine, at least for, for things that we control. How many of you use MySQL? Wow, OK, cool. I was expecting a lot of like, Postgres or something. Um, so we use MySQL at Shopify. Uh, one thing that, that happens sometimes is there's slow queries, right? And MySQL gives us right, a really nice tool called the MySQL slow query log, right? It's a really nice tool, right? It, it, it logs this to a file. It's so useful. <laughs> <laughs> so it actually is useful if you can figure out what causes slow queries. So I, I want to go through like a, our three step of how to determine uh, the root cause of a, of a slow query, because I find it pretty interesting. I, figure it would be useful for others to know this. So here we go. Step one, if you're using Nginx, there's this module called, uh, I, I put the link there, Nginx request ID. What this does is it exposes a, a variable in your Nginx config that you can pass along as a header. And it's just a unique ID for this specific request. That won't help us, not alone. Uh, the second step is, uh, there's this thing called log process action in Rails. And what it allows you to do is it allows you to add stuff to the, the, the last line of a request. You know, it says like completed 200K, okay, you can add stuff there. So we add the request ID there. So we're getting there. Step three, wait for it. Use uh, Marginalia, which is a, a base camp gen. And what this does out of the box is it, it adds the name of the controller and the action that performed the query. But we also add the request ID there. This is pretty crazy because once all that's done, our slow query log looks like this now. And that's way more useful because we, we can see exactly what request starting from engine uh, caused the slow query. And that will allow us to, to make it easier to debug the, the root cause of the uh, slow query. We actually have like this nice like nginx to rails to slow query uh, relation. And there's a bonus too. We, 
we add the request ID whenever we queue a background job. So this allows us to know what request queued the job. Because sometimes it's interesting to know this if you're debugging something. So the next thing I want to talk about is resiliency. Anybody know what that means? No? Or maybe you're shy. I don't know what it means. I'm going to read a quote. <laughs> Uh, this code, okay, a resilient system is one that functions with one or more components being unavailable or unacceptably slow. Okay, that makes sense. So here's what happens. You start building a Rails app. You're, you're having a really good time, typing away. You need, a, you need to use sessions, right? Because you want to remember if someone's logged in or not. So you add this session store. Then you continue coding away. Uh, now you need background jobs. So you add Redis. And then you add Memcache. And then your users want to be able to search for whatever reason. So you add Elasticsearch. And then the next thing you know, someone calls you up with this screenshot of this famous like 500 error, and you're like, oh god, and like the person on the phone are pissed off because like they can't get to your site. What went wrong? So what went wrong is that you just assume that these services work, right? You, I mean, Redis doesn't go down. Like you, you did sudo app get install Redis, so it's on the same machine. Like it shouldn't go down, right? So you, you assume that, that things are always up and fast, but in reality, like that's that's not the case. And basically, um, don't let minor dependencies take you down. You, you don't want something like the session store to take your whole app down, right? Because really, all, the only thing you need the session store for is to make sure the customer's logged in or not. So you, you probably have this code in, in a before filter that, that checks if there's a session ID it loads a customer. The problem with this code is that if the session store is down, this before filter is just going to explode for every single request, right? Um, and that's bad. So what can we do here? Well, you can rescue data store unavailable. I mean, it works. It's probably not at the right level of, of uh, abstraction, but um, this is something that we should always do. We should always um, take, not take for granted that the session store will be up. And you should do this for every data store, that, except for, like, I guess, your database. Because if your database is down, I guess your whole app is down. So adding these, sprinkling these rescues in your code base will help, but if you don't have tests, um, to ensure that these flows uh, do work without these data stores. Um, someone can go around and just remove the rescue and think that, oh, it's useless, and then you're back to state one where your app goes down. So we built this, uh, this tool called Toxic Proxy. And what it is, is a, it's a very simple TCP proxy that you put, um, and it's not just Rails specific, it's really just a, it's written Go, it's, it's a proxy that, that, that uh, you put between your Rails app and your services. And what Toxic Proxy does is it, it allows you to simulate um, a service being down, or even worse, a service being slow. Because if the service is down, you'll get the response right away, right? Like, the service is down, connection failed. But if the service is slow, well, that's another thing <coughs> which you're, it's just slow. And the cool thing about Toxic Proxy is that uh, we released a Ruby library that, that allows you to control it. So we have Toxic Proxy in between our rails, and our, our minor dependencies in the development environment and in the test environment. And what this allows us to do is we can write tests to assert that, um, for instance, in this case, we're testing that the, when the session store is down, that the, um, that the request to slash still responds successfully. So now we're absolutely sure that this flow works, even if, even if uh, the session store is down. There's this really nice blog post. I'm going to post the slides after the talk that describes uh, the process of making Shopify resilient. It's, I, I'd encourage anybody to read it. But essentially, the TLDR is we, we did what I just described for all the minor uh, dependencies we had. So we came up with this, this nice um, table of here's, like, here's the Shopify checkout, here's the Shopify web channel, and here are all the services that, that that uh, it depends on. And we just make sure that whenever one of these services are down, that there's like a proper fallback. To make sure that we don't render 500s, that we, we try to fall back smartly and serve 200s. Because what's worse? Like, what's worse to the user? Seeing a 500 or, or seeing that they're logged out temporarily? 
seen five records there, obviously better, right? <laughs> So I mentioned slow resources, so these, this is a tough one. So we, um, we have three shards, so we <coughs> split our data into three uh, MySQL databases. Uh, so if, if, for those of you who don't know what sharding is, is basically we have uh, data for say shop one, shop two, shop three on shard one. So this is one MySQL database. And we have the same thing for like shard two, shard three, so we, we split our shops into three shards. And then we put Rails in front of that, and whenever a request comes in, using the host name, we can determine what shard that shop is on, and we query that database. Sounds really cool, right? But there's a problem with that. What happens if, if uh, shard one is slow? Because, because the same Rails app is serving all three shards, um, if shard one is slow, well, your unicorn workers are going to start responding slower. And at one point, they won't be able to take any, any more connections, right? Doesn't that kind of defeat the purpose of sharding? Isn't, sharding, isn't the point of sharding to, to be able to just kill off one shard and still be able to serve traffic <coughs> to the other two shards? So we thought about this, and we're thinking, well, how can we make it so that um, shard one being slow doesn't affect shard two and shard three? How can we fail fast on this? So we have this, uh, this gem called Senian, which is a, a smart circuit breaker. So the idea here is, I'll, I'll just show some code, it'll probably make more sense. Um, we register the shard one as a resource. And we say, um, there's five tickets. So you, you can do five queries on shard one at a time. There's a timeout. So if there's a sixth query coming in, we wait 0.5 seconds until a, a ticket is uh, freed up. If it doesn't free up, then we just pretend that MySQL shard one is not there. So that's our way of failing fast. So if there's a slow query that's, that's, um, that's causing shard one to, to respond slower, um, we'll only respond slow to five requests, and then the other requests will just fail right away. So there's, like, there's a couple other settings here. So there's an error threshold. So the idea is here is if we have 100 errors, um, we're just going to pretend the shard one is, is, is down. So we'll, we'll uh, open the circuit. And um, after 10 seconds, we're going to put the circuit to a half open state. And the idea here is that we're going to let a bit of traffic go through. And if we see that shard one is, is healthy again, we, we close the circuit. But if shard one is not healthy, um, we reopen it. Um, so the idea here is that uh, we reduce the impact of one database being slow. Uh, for the rest of the connections. And the way, the way you use this in Rails is you basically acquire uh, a resource and you do your query within that, that block. So if we go back to our example, now if shard one is slow, Semian will kill it off and we'll be able to still serve traffic in shard two and shard three successfully. So what else can go wrong? So many things can go wrong. <laughs> These are all the things that we depend on. So we, have, we depend on shipping rate providers like FedEx, UPS. We depend on payment gateways, Stripe, PayPal, fulfillment services, internal services. So during Black Friday, um, all these services um, are throwing the same amount of traffic as Shopify. So even if Shopify can scale our internal services, we're still at the mercy of of, say, FedEx for calculating shipping rates. So for this, we have um, manual uh, circuit breakers. Uh, and basically, they're just flags. So we, we wrap our things with if statements, and we can manually go into a, a panel and disable a specific service. So let's say PayPal's having a hard time during Black Friday, which is going to panel, disable PayPal, and Shopify continues working for everybody else that doesn't use PayPal. So Any questions? Yeah. Dean, this is fun. Is he, are his attacks uh, unexpected? <laughs> like, you know when he's coming? Or is it <coughs> so this is pretty cool. Okay, so for, <laughs> are, is Genghis kind of predictable? Yes. Yeah. So we have a Google Calendar event where we say, 
do a Genghis run at this time. So that is predictable. But the cool thing about Genghis Khan, or at least not, not, not Genghis Khan specifically, but the cool thing is we use Genghis Khan to do, um, I'm not sure if you've heard of Chaos Monkey before. Yeah. It's a thing that Netflix does. So they, they just randomly pull plugs and like, they throw a monkey in, in the data center and just like, wreck havoc, right? So we started using the Genghis um, flows, so the, the scripts, for this too. You get it for free, right? So we have one that's predictable, but we also have a, our Chaos Monkey that just wrecks havoc, um, but at a, at a lower intensity. But our, our Genghis runs are really like, here's what we expect for next year's Black Friday, and we run it, and we have our mouse on the, on the stop button, in case anything goes wrong, but in most cases we, we go gradually, so we, we know, like, we've never actually put Shopify down with Genghis Khan before. Yeah. DDoS in production. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So I have a question about payments. You said that you remove every payment to the payment uh, right? Yeah. So how do you know when the payment is uh, something wrong with payment? Yeah, so um, how does the, so when we put payment processing in a background job, how does the user know that the payment went, went through correctly? So normally when you're on a checkout flow, you hit submit, you, I mean you enter your credit card information, you hit submit, and the next page you see is thank you, your, your payment was successful. Um, in our case, we had to add a, a, a page that says please wait. Um, what I showed you was a 95th percentile. On average, like, Payment processing takes like a second. So the worst, like on average, like the users will, will stay on this page for a second and we just refresh, we pull the page. Um, and our payment processing job sets a flag on, on our order model called like payment successful or, or whatever. And, and once that flag is there, we, we send a person to the receipt page. Um, we also, I mean, if there's an error, we also just send them back to the order process. But yeah, you need to add like a, a, a spinner page, which is not ideal, but like if you use Ajax, you can make the experience better by like just making the spinner on a button or something. Yeah. Does that have some of the external dependencies to your caching of those web services? Yeah, actually that's a good point. Um, so caching of external dependencies. Uh, one that's, that's here. One that's a bit obvious is the shipping rates. So we cache the shipping rates with um, basically, like, if you're shipping from point A to point B with a given cart, the prices will always be the same, right? Or at least for a certain amount of period. So we cash shipping rates for six days. Uh, it's not six days, sorry, six hours. Um, and it's just like, it's a memcache. You just like, the key is probably like, the address is hashed and like the cart content. Yeah. I guess I was gonna ask something sort of similar. So it's always hard to think about minor dependencies because none of them really feel minor. <laughs> yeah. When you're in the middle of it, uh, what are and the shipping rates providers is, is like the perfect example, right? Because you can't calculate, you can't calculate that. You feel like you can't really fill a cart. Uh, well, I don't know. Are, are there other other ways to respond to some of these other minor dependencies? So actually, I, I would consider these major dependencies. Yeah. Um, the minor dependencies are like. Um, Honestly, like the session storage it was a, a real use case at Shopify, so we had this before filter that, that was trying to load the, your, your customer ID from the session store, and when the session store goes down, like, all of Shopify just goes down. So that one was, you don't think about it, right? You just assume that they, they work. Um, for the shipping rate providers, you just need to think about something. If, so if FedEx is down, we can't provide any rates to people, right? at all, like people can't check out, and that's pretty bad, right? So what we do for that is we have so much data in our, in our databases that we try to be smart about it and try to estimate the ship rate. We can look at like, um, did anybody order this exact cart to say this state from this state yesterday? And we can kind of, we can approximate the amount and, and use that. But like again, like we're, we're really at the mercy of, of, of these, um, external services. And there's there's really nothing we can do besides providing fallbacks. Yeah. If you guess wrong, you just you just eat the cost then? Uh, yeah. The merchant would yeah. I guess, yeah. I mean you can be smart about it and like maybe add a dollar or something, I don't know. Yeah. yeah it's tough. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, you open the server on FedEx now. Um, do you really just 
Um, so what we did for last Black Friday is, is really just very simple. We just wrap everything with an if, and when you, when you open the circuit, all the UI elements go away. Um, interesting part here is that some of our merchants have multiple shipping providers, so even if we kill off FedEx, like they, they still work supply with some um, some, uh, some rates. Sorry. Uh, same thing for like payment gateways. A lot of our, our merchants accept two payment gateways, primarily like Stripe, or like a credit card, and PayPal. So if PayPal had issues, we, we'd still be able to pay with a credit card. But yeah, but the UI elements do go away. Yeah. Mm. Um, in your rescue, yeah, okay, I'm just going back to this, okay. Well, this can be a nice place to put StatsD. Like, you, you, can, you can record this in StatsD and then have like alerts that say, oh, this session story is having troubles. Um, this is a very simple example, but like, you could, I could totally see putting like a, a, a StatsD, uh, count here and have an alert that, that says like if, if there is more than like 10 errors on sessions with like a minute far off an alert then someone can look into it. Yeah. You probably should do that because that's like a rescue and like close your eyes. <laughs> Any other questions?